Happy Friday, guys. Welcome back to The Liz Wheeler Show. Um, thank you in advance, preemptively, for all the emails that you're going to send me about my wardrobe for today. We, we can't decide if it's more orange is, orange is the new black or more Linda Yaccarino, but you are welcome to weigh in. <laughs> we would enjoy your comments as well. Um, be sure to subscribe to the show. Go to Apple Podcasts if you'd like to listen on audio. Go to rumble.com slash Liz Wheeler if you'd like to listen or if you'd like to view it on video. We appreciate each and every one of you that subscribes. So what I want to do today for the show is I want to take you onto the ground in North Carolina. North Carolina, an ostensibly red state, right? Not exactly the state that would come to my mind first and foremost if I think of a hotbed of the transgender ideology aimed specifically at children. Honestly, I'd probably think of California, maybe think of New York, I'd think of these very leftist radical states, maybe some of the cities, the very radical uh, leftist cities in our country like Baltimore or Chicago, not North Carolina. But what's happening in North Carolina is quite shocking, it's quite disturbing, and I think it substantiates a lot of what, especially parents, feel intuitively about the institutions that we have formerly relied on for um, taking care of and educating our children, right? So from a personal perspective here, um, one of the things that I have changed my mind on in the last couple of years is the public school system. I was never like a huge fan of public schools, I was homeschooled myself, but I've become very red-pilled about public schools because I no longer see them as um, an institution that is primarily dedicated to educating students. I never thought that they did that well, but in the last couple of years, I've realized, well, they don't do that at all. They're now just a, a, they've now just been weaponized. They're an institution captured by ideologues who wish to change our children, transform our children into revolutionaries. Some conservatives still think that this is too extreme of a view, I'll wait a couple of years for you guys to catch up if that if I've just described you. Um, but I no longer think that public schools are even a safe environment for our children. I feel the same way as a mom of a two-year-old. I feel the same way about pediatrics, about pediatricians. And I know some conservatives are going to push back on this. And I'm sure that there are individual pediatricians who are good, loving, Christian, science-based people. But the institution of pediatrics, the institution, our, our medical industry, has been co-opted by this very same radical leftist ideology, this neo-Marxist ideology, and they've married each other, right? The education system and the medical industry have gotten in bed together, and it is the most terrifying prospect for not just individual parents, although, like I said, speaking from personal experience, it is terrifying as a parent, but also for any concerned citizen about the ramifications of this union between the medical industry and the schools should terrify us about the future of the nation. So back to North Carolina. North Carolina, an ostensibly red state, not the state you would think of as a hotbed of the transgender ideology aimed specifically at young children, but it is. In fact, North Carolina has written the blueprint on how to embed this ideology into every institution that touches children in a way that leaves parents completely out of it as these radical activists come after children as young as two, three, and four years old in order to try to trans them. That's what we're gonna talk about today, so let's get to it. I wanna to talk to you about my favorite new app. It's called Upside. So feel me on this. At most gas pumps, you'll see two different prices, right? The price that you're about to pay and the 10 cent off price that you would be paying if only you had that rewards card that, let's be realistic, you probably don't have. The trouble with rewards cards is that if you're on the go, like we are, you can't always fill up at the same place. Well, let me tell you, there's an easy way to get cash back at multiple gas stations. It's called Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anybody who buys gas or really buys anything. With Upside, you get cash back on every gallon of gas that you buy. Upside actually offsets inflated gas prices by giving you cash back on your purchases. It's great. The app is super easy to use. You don't have to be tech savvy at all. All you do to get started is download the free Upside app. You can use my promo code, Liz5, to get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. Next, you claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Then you just pay as usual with a credit or debit card, follow the steps in the app, and voila, you get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning hundreds of dollars a year. So download the free Upside app. Use my promo code Liz5 to get an extra 25 cents back for every gallon on your first tank of gas. Just download the free Upside app. Use my promo code Liz5. 
Also, 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 guys, before we get to the topic of the show today, I could not be more excited to announce that we've launched our own website, lizwheeler.com. This has been so long in the making, and I know earlier in the week I said I have been working so hard on this website, and I have, but it's not just me as an individual. Our entire team here at The Liz Wheeler Show has been working for months, actually for months, to build this website. It's a website where you can find articles about um, the latest medical studies, whether that's related to transgenderism, whether that's related to COVID, whether that's related to masks or vaccines, the stuff that we as based Americans need to know that the mainstream media doesn't want us to know. There will also be, when we talk about topics in the show where I'm uh, substantiating a point that I'm making with research, that'll be on the website as well. The latest episodes will be on the website, transcripts, from the episode, you can read along if you don't want if you don't want to listen to my voice every moment of the day. You can read along those transcripts. Um, it's great. I can't wait for you to go check it out. Go see it, LizWheeler.com. We're also launching a newsletter so that we can constantly be in touch. Let's be real. We know it's just a matter of time before YouTube gives me the boot. I don't want to lose contact with you guys. I know it's over three hundred fifty thousand of you who have subscribed to my YouTube channel. It would break my heart if that somehow got terminated before we'd been able to establish a connection somewhere else. So make sure you sign out for my newsletter at lizwheeler.com and let me know what you think. We've poured a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into this, um, and we're excited to hear your feedback and hear hear what you think. So leave a comment on the site. Tell us what you think. Tell us if you find any typos or errors that we need to smooth out, iron out, given that this is the first week of the launch. lizwheeler.com. Okay, so on the ground in North Carolina, that's where I want to start today. I want to start by recognizing the um, verbal narrative that comes from the radical trans activists whenever you or I bring up the topic of children being trans. I actually recently um, spoke at James Madison University, and at the end of my speech, we held a question and answer, and one of the students came up and said, I don't think that children are being trans. I don't think that children are undergoing transgender surgeries or what I would call child bodily mutilation. And I just said, Google it, look it up. This is happening. And hopefully you will change your mind once you realize that it's happening. But the first, the first response that transgender activists give you, give me, every time that we bring up these surgeries that are being performed on, on children or this transitioning of children that's happening is they deny it. They say, you're making it up. It doesn't happen to children. This is something that only happens to adolescents, they say, teenagers, even though teenagers technically, technically, legally are still children in the eyes of the law. They say it's not happening to children, just just adolescents, just maybe, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds. And then they say, well, maybe it happens to children, but not that often, right? Not that often, only in extreme cases. And then, and then of course, their ultimate narrative, once they've finally been debunked over and over and over, as their narrative has evolved, they finally say, well, Yes, it is happening. It is happening to children. And the only reason that you oppose it is because you're a bigot. And because you're bigoted, these children, if they are deprived of these life-saving surgeries, then they commit suicide. So you are essentially killing these children if you don't support these surgeries. This is the narrative arc of the transgender ideology as it relates to to the quote-unquote gender-affirming care being applied to small children. And it is hard to believe. It is hard to believe when you think of a two-year-old, I have a two and a half-year-old, when you think of a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a first grader or a middle schooler, it's really difficult to, to even imagine what that would be like, right? To imagine, imagine one of these children being trans because they're such innocent, perfect little people and it would require such an immense amount of brainwashing for them to even claim to be to be taught to say that they are trans, to be taught to say that they don't belong in this body. And it's so absurd that the majority of the American people, both Republicans and Democrats, this is a very important point, the majority of the American people oppose transing kids. The majority of the American people think that we should legally prohibit transgender surgeries on minors. This is a, a, a Trafalgar Group poll. This was uh, alongside the Convention of the States action. They released data that shows, and this is a quote, 78.7% of voters believe that underage minors should be required to wait until they are adults to legally use puberty blockers and undergo permanent sex change procedures. 78.7% of voters. That's not just a little majority, right? That's not just a plurality. That's an overwhelming number of people who vote believe this. And crucially, 
84.6% of independents believe this, and 53.2% of Democrats also say this. So independents, Republicans, maybe we assumed that independents and Republicans would be opposed to this. Even the majority of Democrats are opposed to children being trans, which brings us to this question. If the majority of public opinion is such an overwhelming majority that it's really not even argued except by this radical fringe, then how come we haven't outlawed the transing of children, this transgender surgery, this bodily mutilation surgery in every state? Why are we even still having this conversation? Why haven't we had state legislatures, our representatives at the state level, ban this? It's not that hard to do. Why haven't we? And the answer to that is because it's not put to popular vote. We're not a pure democracy. And I'm not advocating that we should be. We shouldn't be. But what's happened is that civil institutions like the education system and the medical community have colluded in a way to bypass essentially the civil institution of the family and parents and government doesn't know where to start. Oftentimes our state legislatures aren't even aware of what's happening on the ground in our communities targeting our children, but it's become so deeply embedded into our system that your child, if you take them to a pediatrician, if you send them to public school, are not going to be able to escape this. Like I said, we're going to now head to the ground in North Carolina to, uh, to, to, to unpackage the blueprint for how trans activists are targeting two, three, and four-year-olds for transgender transitions. All right, with me now is the president of the Education First Alliance, Sloan Rackmuth. Sloan, thank you for joining us on the show. Um, I want to ask you first, I mean, this is pretty almost unbelievable information. When people read this at first, they're like, is this really true? Like, are people actually transing their two-year-olds? Two-year-olds can't even clearly talk. They're three-year-olds, they're four-year-olds. You found that this was happening at three university healthcare systems in North Carolina, Duke, UNC, and ECU. How did you even find this? Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate that. And you're right. It is a, a very unbelievable uh, situation that we have here in North Carolina. So, um, our organization, Education First Alliance, is made up of researchers, investigative journalists um, that have been doing this work, the, the nexus of education and healthcare, for the last two and a half years. Um, you've already reported on this. You, you know, they're they're coming for our children, right? So they're doing these things, uh, bringing the the psychiatrists into the class, using these surveys, et cetera. So we've been on this and on social emotional learning for very early on. So once we discovered that the clinics were doing trainings for teachers and principals on pronoun usage, uh, the lack of the binary, et cetera, and moreover, how to refer them patients, um, that was our first tip off. We, we saw that they're uh, generating referrals and using teachers. And we said, okay, let's check into this even more. And we discovered the first clinic um, was ECU, then UNC, and then Duke. And really two, three, and four-year-olds? I, not to sound like a skeptic here, because I believe in evil, and I've seen the evil that these people are perpetuating on our children, but ha do they advertise that they will see children this young? Are there actually toddlers being trans in North Carolina? Well, they do advertise that. Duke, um, they've advertised this since 2015. It was right under our noses and because it is so absolutely, patently, ludicrously unbelievable. No one raised an eyebrow. Um, you know, ECU has actually put out there that, yes, we do. We, we are opening this new pride clinic and we know that four-year-olds start having their identity and it's for all ages. And then UNC has followed suit with this. And so uh, we learned a little bit. We learned a lot, actually. And here's how we did our research. Uh, prior statements, because these doctors, they're not just doctors. They're not your corner pediatrician. They're activists. So they want people to know this. They've been talking about this. So we're using their statements, uh, which videos testimony. Uh, insiders, so we've got a, a very robust network of whistleblowers on the inside of the clinic, and the websites of each of these three clinics and medical schools. And Liz, they're, they're not just treating children. And I want to put this in perspective for everybody. We're talking about North Carolina's 
hospital system. That's UNC. 100 counties we have in North Carolina, they have access to all 100 counties. They don't just have access to the children. They've got access to the schools and they're training medical school um, people, you know, doctors, whether it's a specialist, a psychologist, a therapist, and, and all the disciplines. And, you know, we're not looking at it correctly. They're, they're activists. They're Marxists. They're, they're the real deal. So they they want to erase gender. They want to erase this this concept they have of, of this binary, um, and they want to catch children before they've had sexual experiences, before they can even think of having children. That's what they're doing. Guys, you have to get four patriots. China already screwed us over once with COVID. I do not want it to happen again. The Chinese Communist Party right now is doing something shady. Shocker, I know. They're hoarding massive amounts of food, over two thirds of the globe's corn reserves, over half of its rice and over half of its wheat. But when they're asked why they're doing this, China just lies. The reason though, the reason China is doing this is because China thinks that we are on the verge of a global food shortage. And China, being the world's number one food importer, relies on the rest of the world to keep their people fed so they cannot afford to mess up. Or they're gonna, what, face riots, civil panic, maybe even worse, when over a billion people can't eat. So what does this mean for you and for me? Two words, food shortages. These global food shortages that China sees in our future are going to impact the United States of America. That's why you must stock up on Four Patriots Survival Food. I highly recommend you begin your own stockpile of Four Patriots Survival Food Kits. The kits are compact, they stack easily, they have different breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And right now you can get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots Survival Food by using my promo code Liz at checkout. Just go to fourpatriots.com, use my code Liz to get 10% off your first purchase of Four Patriots Survival Food. That's fourpatriots.com, promo code Liz. It makes me sick to my stomach. My daughter is almost two and a half years old. This is the age that these taught that that these medical institutions and these schools are trying to groom children into being transgender. Mm. A two and a half year old, like my sweet, innocent little girl. I I think it was the most shocking part of this to me. Like I said, it's unbelievable yet also believable when you understand the reality of the political enemy that we're facing, these neo-Marxists. It's believable that they would do this to children, but reading some of the quotes of the individuals who run these clinics, like who is this, Dr. Deanna Adkins, um, who runs the Duke the Duke Medicine Gender Clinic that opened in 2015. I explain this conundrum to me. You know, Dr. Deanna Adkins goes, they're not old enough, and this is this is toddlers, they're not old enough to consciously just choose to do that. It's not a choice in any of my patients. Not a choice. It's really just an unpleasant thing to have going on in your body to feel that distress about yourself. I can't imagine anyone who would choose to do that. But this is like a two-year-old and a three-year-old. So somebody is making that choice. That's actually that's actually a good point to make. Well, yeah. Well, see, we also learned a lot about how these clinics work because it'd be we'd be hard-pressed to, to say that parents are, are walking in and saying, hey, my child plays with a truck, let's go ahead and start treatment. What, what is happening is this, there is no actual clinic. So let me give you an example. Duke says that it has a clinic and we think of, okay, a freestanding, maybe location, uh, a research body, it doesn't work that way. What they're doing is taking referrals from child psychiatry, Family medicine is a really big driver, pediatrics um, and other departments. And they're training folks on the inside of those clinics to refer patients to them. And here's how it presents. Let's say you bring in a four-year-old, they're a picky eater, they're underweight, there's a problem. They will bring that child, and we know this, they'll bring that child to a maybe a, a family doctor or psychologist, and the, the psychologist will refer them on or will be comfortable enough saying, listen, Sally, it isn't just an eating problem Sally has. It's something we call gender dysphoria. Let me refer you on and you can be treated here by a specialist. That's what's going on. It's predatory, manipulative. We have to stop it. It's horrendous. So when you did expose this, what did you expect these hospital and medical systems to say compared to what they actually did? I, well, we fully expected that they would lie. Um, we knew that. What we didn't expect and we were delighted about is that on the same night, within 20 minutes apart, they all three issued statements that uh, that were not really denials. I mean, they were like, look, we are not treating transgender toddlers. And then they go on and they say that they're following 
uh, clinical, you know, best practices for treatment of children. Now we know that WPATH has no age standard. So it's in the middle and not in middle. We were ready for it. And as soon as they came out with that, then we started bringing out the videos. Then we started bringing out uh, other information. When you have them on camera, it's really hard to keep lying to the public. And can we bring can we bring those tweets up? Actually, I want to I want to show everyone. I want to read what these hospitals tweeted in response. All three of them, and obviously this wasn't a coincidence, right? If you if you release a statement within twenty minutes of each other, this is what Duke Health said. They said online misinformation about toddlers starting gender gender transitions at Duke is false. Duke Health has provided high quality, compassionate, and evidence based gender care to both adolescents and adults for many years. Okay, so. They said that they do on their website, but now they're denying it. That's that's false. UNC Health goes, there's false information circulating on social media related to the gender care that UNC Health provides for patients. Okay, so it's the same words that they're using. And then we have ECU, I believe. Let's bring that one up. ECU goes, ECU Health does not offer gender-affirming surgery to minors, nor does the health system offer gender-affirming transition care to toddlers. As a mission-driven organization, ECU Health cares for all community members regardless of beliefs or identification. So, Solon, are they just lying because they think the public will believe them? Yeah, there is misinformation and it's coming from them. Absolutely. I mean, look, Duke, let's take Duke. In all of their, oh, by the way, they've also taken their web pages down. Each of these institutions have, of course they have. taken their website down. Yeah, and in and in some cases they actually laundered them. Let me tell you how UNC um, they've taken down. In fact, UNC is the most egregious example. They've taken down their adolescent uh, transgender program and their very robust adult uh, sex change program. Taken it all down. Um, Duke, the, their nomenclature is, and it has been for time immemorial, that they treat three different populations, pediatric, youth, and adult. They've scrubbed that from the bios of uh, some of their clinicians. And they've also uh, cleansed, if you will, the website of of this. Some of the clinicians claim to be developing a diagnostic tool to determine whether or not young children, that is pediatric and the pediatric population, to determine whether or not they are transgender so that family practice uh, folks and, and others can diagnose your toddler with transgenderism. And then oh. what is that? It begs the treatment. They're doing it. They're conducting research on it. They don't want you to know. I think the best evidence for that is their own words and the fact they've erased all the stuff. It's literally chilling. By the way, this is one of the many reasons that I fired my pediatrician because I hate to say it. And I know that so many parents across the country feel the same way. We just don't walk into a pediatrician's office and have any trust, any trust for the, even for the individual. I'm sure that there's good hearted individuals who are pediatricians, but they are so tied to this, what's called evidence-based medicine or these standard of care that are dictated by these so-called professional organizations, whether that's the American Academy of Pediatrics, whether that's specialty organizations like WPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, that they are required to follow these standards. Otherwise, they could face legal liability if they don't follow those standards and the outcome is something less than the patient uh, likes or something that is not good for the patient. I don't trust pediatricians because of this. Talk to me about, you mentioned this a couple minutes ago, and I, I want to hear more. So WPATH, we've talked about WPATH on this show. Talk about um, what the standard of care that pediatricians would be required to follow when it comes to children that they diagnose with gender dysphoria. What, what are those standards? Well, I'm not a medical expert, but I will say this. I believe that pediatricians may have the latitude to follow the um, the endocrine society, pediatric endocrine society's guidelines as well, and I believe that that has a different, um, more you know, none of it is acceptable, but it certainly wouldn't be uh, crazy like WPATH. But uh, WPATH had a, a standard that was um, in its seventh edition uh, that that set guidelines. For instance, puberty blockers wouldn't be given until um, later stage 10 or two. 10 or two means, uh, let's say a nine-year-old or even a 10-year-old 
um, would pro probably be classified as 10 or 2. Um, and then hormones were not to be given until 16 years old. Um, they removed that, they meaning WPATH removed it. This is the interesting thing. I believe in August of 2022, a uh, great outcry came from the moon bats in the um, Rainbow Mafia, not the um, the gay people that don't like their name used for this crap, but the wackos, right? We have them in every group. Uh, they came out and said, no, 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 you can't have age limits. And so what do, what do you know? I think by September, WPATH pulled it. So there, there are no limits. So you can, it's, it's a complete free-for-all. Um, and, and as for lawsuits, you know, and I, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I have been talking to some and, you know, following the, the WPATH uh, guidelines, it, it may not, you know, completely inoculate these, these doctors from lawsuits. I, I hope not if these doctors are committing these atrocities on children's bodies. Um, however, I hardly trust, I hardly trust our, the litigious aspect of our um, medical industry right now. Okay, this is one of my favorite new sponsors, Grip6, and funny story here. So is anybody listening to the show Obsessed with Pickleball? After I read the first ad that Grip6 had placed on my show, my mom calls me, my mom listens to my show, and she says, oh, pickleball paddles from Grip6. Could you please get dad and I two of those in the classic design, she asks. And I'm like, okay, mom, sure. Yes, let me ask Grip6 to send you some of their bird pickleball paddles so that you guys can be more awesome at this game. I have actually not played pickleball before, but my parents apparently love it. Um, I know a lot of people watching this show love it. So let me tell you about Grip6's bird pickleball paddles that my parents want. These paddles are American-made. They're designed to elevate your game and also to bring more fun to your summer. They're made of the highest quality four-layer T700 carbon fiber. They're engineered. The friction is engineered for maximum spin and for a focus on durability and rigidity. Bird pickleball paddles are the most forgiving paddles out there. They're perfectly engineered to upgrade your game. And you get to choose between the classic design, the innovative ergonomic design, which does reduce reduce strain on your elbow and joints while also increasing power and ease for backhand hits and spikes. I uh, highly recommend you visit birdpickleball.com, birdpickleball.com to get your paddle today, birdpickleball.com. So here's an here, here's a, a very important point I think that needs to be made. There, it, the situations at these gender clinics for children in North Carolina are not just situations where wacko parents out of the blue say, listen, my, my child is cross-dressing. My child is telling me repeatedly that they are a different gender. I'm going to, of my own volition, go to this gender clinic. This is not what's happening. It's either happening through the referrals that you mentioned or it's happening because these particular clinics, these very same clinics, have their tentacles around the public school system where children are sent from the time they're like three years old now. Every year, it seems like they've added yeah. a different layer of, of kindergarten or preschool um, in order to fully form these young children, to separate them from their families. This was something that you found um, related specifically to Duke University and a Duke psychologist by the name of Dane Wicker. I want to show you the video of him talking about how they have just captured the institution of the public school system with this ideology, but in order to fully grasp just how awful it is that they've captured the institution of the school system with this ideology, I want you to hear him articulate what his ideology actually is. What is it that he believes about transing little kids? What is it that he believes the medical community and schools should do and parents should not be allowed to be involved in? So take a listen to this. Um, and I, I just really want um, people to, to understand a little bit more about that. You know, I think a lot of parents get scared uh, when they're, you know, kind of might disclose something. And, you know, looking at this bill, it's like they're so scared that they might be hiding something from them, maybe for good reason, but they're, um, but they're trying to codify it into law. And so we know that they're, we know that they're early bloomers, they're late bloomers naturally. And this is a really well thought out process that we work on in our team and um, when I need to be able to have adequate time to assess and address the child's gender identity and experience and work with them and their families, even families who are having problems. And the goal of that is to make sure that this kid, this kid goes through the right puberty. Um, and so puberty suppressants, even though there not many people get the chance to use them, uh, really allow us the time that we need to 
induce a late blooming puberty where we can work together as family with mental health providers, with endocrinologists and an interdisciplinary team to figure out what's going to put that child on the best trajectory for their life going forward. Because the repercussions of going through the wrong puberty are pretty awful um, and unnecessary medical risks uh, associated with gender, major gender affirming surgeries in the future. It's like bilateral mastectomy. If you're forcing people to delay puberty or, um, or not, not to, or to, you're forcing pubertal development that could be the wrong pubertal development, they may have to have major surgeries. Um, it could also be unwanted and difficult or impossible. Some of these developments being done, like skeletal structure, your hands, how broad your shoulders are, even the best surgeon couldn't necessarily help fix that. Okay, this is actually a perfect example. I'm glad we played this clip before we played the part about the schools because this is the ideology of the psychologist that runs this clinic. I mean, these words, Sloan, these phrases that he's using, right puberty, the repercussions of going through wrong puberty, and quote unquote, forcing pubertal development, which if I'm not mistaken, what he means by that is just allowing a child to properly develop as God made them biologically. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so... Uh, dangerous. I mean, I imagine that, uh, you know, eugenicists spoke this way of protecting society from the wrong people being able to breed. It's sickening. It's absolutely sickening. And I, I really, you know, I'm glad that you played that one first. Yes, because these are the kind of people that want to get their hands on our children. That's for sure. I mean, you see something like that and you know they have to be stopped. And that's why, that's why people all over the world are absolutely horrified. I mean, you do outrageous stuff, expect outrage. These people should have expected outrage. Now they know, and now I believe the entire world has awoken to this. I mean, our our story has been shared 4.8 million times, something like that. Um, this is so unbelievable, so disgusting, so disturbing. Um, you know, I think now these universities are coming to terms with what they have allowed to happen in their name and in our name, the people of North Carolina. Right. And I, I feel like one of the ways that I've gotten um, more red pilled over the past couple of years is um, about public schools. I was never a proponent of public schools. I was homeschooled myself and I, I saw what that experience was for myself and for other people. I compared that to public school um, the, the average public school experience. So I was never like a fan of public schools, but I feel like in the last couple of years, I have become so red pilled on public schools that I'm not even sure that they should exist in their current form because all they do now is serve as a direct funnel for this poison from this poison from these university medical systems, these individual, these, these creeps, these evil people who want to harm our children and the public school systems like, Hey, Raising my hand, I'm here, I'll help you. I'll make sure that this bypasses parents and goes directly into the minds of these impressionable children. Um, schools has been a really important part of our clinic's practice and working with the parents to help them advocate for safe environments for um, transgender and non-binary children and so, um, or youth adolescents. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are able to get um, to work with our uh, educators and our principals, administrators, and quite frankly, it's most effective if it actually starts at the top and kind of goes down as as an um, an edict across all classes, and you know things like having a substitute teacher and. Um, calling out names. They may call out uh, a name of a, an adolescent who is not out as being trans, um, but may not have had a legal name change. So they're um, essentially outing children um, in some of these cases. So we really do want to have close partnerships with schools um, and uh, to keep our children safe. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Professor Wilson. May I, uh, may I actually piggyback off of what Dr. Wicker was just Please saying? Please do. Thank you. Uh, so just to, to reiterate how 
far these bills depart from prevailing medical knowledge. Um, for example, SB2, um, bills like this have been met with disapproval by leaders from multiple medical organizations. Okay, Sloan, detail for me. This is this is from your reporting. Um, what this partnership that he's talking about, that this Duke psychiatrist mentions, this partnership that he has with schools, this is not just, oh, we're buddy-buddy with them. There's something official on the books here. Well, yes, there is. So nationwide, there's been a real push and, and from both Republicans and Democrats to put in mental health uh, workers inside of the schools. And so, um, and that's a big part of this too. I mean, that's how they're getting access. So Duke has a partnership with uh, about 150 schools to go in and, and train teachers. We believe it's also children, but get access to them uh, via telehealth. And so can you imagine the damage that's going to be done with children being able to meet with psychiatrists via Zoom. See, North Carolina, the age of consent to receive care for mental health specifically is zero. California, it's 12. Uh, other places, it's 16. North Carolina, zero. So you conceivably would have um, a child that is three giving their own consent, even though that we know informed consent is it possible for whatever reason this state that they call a red state couldn't be any further from it? It is zero and legislators have not changed that. ECU, by the way, doing the same thing, UNC doing the same thing. So, you know, having that pipeline is very important. Um, doing it behind parents' backs is also very important. We exposed that ECU, while the chancellor was sitting on stage with a clinician, actually, with a researcher um, during the faculty convocation, the, the researcher was talking about how they're going to start a revolutionary new clinic for children to come out to them before they come out to their parents. It's literally horrendous. So not only is there this pipeline between the gender clinics and the children directly through the medical community, yeah. um, Duke Psychiatry and the North Carolina Department of Health have an agreement to provide what they call guidance to 130 schools in the state. Um, it's awful. So North Carolina is supposed to be a red state here. There are some bills in the state legislature which ostensibly ban the actual surgeries, the transgender surgery for kids, but they seem to me, if I, I took a quick read of them, they seem to me that they've been gutted, they've been somewhat neutered, that they still allow much of this transition. They just hold off on the actual um, the actual genital surgery until maybe age 18, but there's still a lot of bad stuff that can happen. Right. I mean, there's the predatory nature. Look, I, our objection to all this is, is threefold. This is predatory. So you're turning in, you know, the social workers, uh, doctor, surgeons, and the predators on our children. It's permanent. We know that. So the things they gutted from this bill, that's the permanency. And it's built on lies. Lies like, it's okay, puberty blockers are completely irreversible or reversible. We know from W. Pat, the leader of that organization's own mouth, that they're not. So, you know, we know all this. So let's talk about Youth Protection Act. This is what um, these uh, Dane Wicker and his associates were in such a kerfuffle about. That bill would have uh, prevented the manipulatory brainwashing that's being done behind the parents' back from health providers, number one, number two, puberty blockers and hormones, and number three, the surgery. So look, if these organizations have all said we're not doing surgeries on, on minors, the bill is DOA, and my organization has made that clear. There's another bill called the Parental Rights Act, and it passed out of our Senate early on in the year, and it will prevent um, teachers from sexualizing children from K to three. That's not acceptable for us. It's going to be pre-K into 12. That's all we're going to accept. And it also will alert the children, or excuse me, will alert parents that children are changing pronouns behind their parents' back or trying to transition. Now, this is what Dane Wicker is just burned up about. He doesn't want the parents to know. And we know why. Cuts down on his supply. It's so creepy. It's so awful. So... This is not just happening in the state of North Carolina. This is not an anomaly. This is not one 
one, one pediatrician, one psychiatrist, one university, one health system, one school. This is something that's rampant across our country. A lot of people that are watching and listening to the show right now know that. They've experienced that. They have children that they maybe are currently in public schools because they don't have another option. Maybe they've pulled their children out and maybe they homeschool them now. Maybe they see this happening to their grandchildren or just in their communities and they want to know what, what they can do. What do you recommend? I mean, you're the one that uncovered this story that put it together, that caused the reaction from these health systems. Um, what can people do in communities that supports this effort to get rid of this? Well, I would go, I would start going to your, um, you know, obviously online is a great way. That's one way. Um, you know, go to the biggest medical school um, in your state. They don't have to have a pediatrics program, guys, because they're doing this in friendly medicine also. And just look up the, the words gender affirming care and pediatrics or and youth in whatever state that you're in. Um, that will turn up a lot because you'll usually find that the bigger institution um, will be teaching the smaller ones how to do it. Then you're going to find um, the folks that are very, um, and they're not going to be behind the scenes. They're going to be very open. Uh, you're going to find the folks that are training others or speaking on this and doing it. Um, and then you can drill down to what conferences they've had. Um, I like to find conferences that actually have video. And so a lot of that will already be on video. So you're going to find um, things like that. Uh, go to their Facebook page. Uh, a lot of these uh, schools are very loud and proud about that. I mean, ECU, not only did the, uh, the LGBTQ Center start this, and they're the de facto chairman of the, the health program there, they also get this, want to open up, would you believe, a homeless shelter for trans teens to come and stay. Oh. So, I mean, the, thing, the things you're going to find, by, by the way, gets better, by researchers with a research interest in trans sex work. So that could be child trafficking. So we need researchers across this country to dig in and find this stuff out because it is absolutely a network. I mean, th if it's going on here, it's going on everywhere. Maybe not as young. But that doesn't mean anything. It, it will, because what we ignore today that's horrifying to us, it will become mainstream a year from now. So it doesn't get any easier standing up. You need to do it now while you can. Yeah, and we so appreciate everything that you've done. I mean, this is incredible work that you've put together. I encourage everybody watching and listening, um, go to the website of Education First Alliance. It's edfirstnc.org. So like Education First North Carolina, edfirstnc.org. I'll post that on lizwheeler.com for anybody who wants to go there to look at it, edfirst.org. Sloan Rackmuth, thank you so much for being here. This was fascinating to listen to. You've done great work. It's so evil what you are confronting and um, we're supporting you 100%. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Also, all of this research from today, this is the kind of stuff that you can find on lizwheeler.com. All of the videos that we played, all of the statistics that we've referred to, all of Sloan's amazing work. Um, we actually posted it right before the show aired. So you can go over to lizwheeler.com and you can look at this. You can dive more deeply into this yourself. That's lizwheeler.com. It's heavy stuff. This kind of episode is difficult for me to film. I assume it's difficult for you to watch and listen to. But if we, as concerned citizens of the United States, actually want to eradicate this, we can't just we can't just sit around and grump about it. We can't just whine about it. We can't just hope that we can talk to our child's teacher about it. We actually have to root it out from whence it stems. And Sloan Rackmuth is writing the playbook for exactly how to do that. So like I said, go to lizwheeler.com. You can find all of the details, what we talked about on the show today over there. Thank you for watching today. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.